Welcome to another episode of GUI Challenges, where I build interfaces my way, and then I challenge you to do it your way, because with our creative minds combined, we're going to find multiple ways to solve these interfaces and expand the diversity of our skills. And in today's GUI Challenge, we're building a <gasps> tooltip. I'd like to start our exploration and conversation about tooltips today with what isn't a tooltip and what is a tooltip. So in this case, this should look like a tooltip. You should be like, oh yeah, that's a tooltip. But what about something like this? Is that a tooltip? Especially if it has interactive content inside of it, is that a tooltip? No, you should be thinking to yourself, those are pretty different. Um, this one here that we're looking at is called a toggle tip. So notice that I have focus on this little plaque right here. I'm also hovering on this little plaque right here. Nothing is showing, why not? Well, it's because it is a toggle tip. I'll hit spacebar and I'll get to see the content that's behind that tooltip. This is a pop-up. It features light dismiss. I can hit escape as well. So here, let me just light dismiss this. I'm going to tab over to this one, hit spacebar. Notice focus is given to the tooltip, to this toggle tip, and then I can tab again to go inside of there and navigate with my keyboard inside of this persistent overlay and hit escape to close it. Now that's very different from a tooltip where I can hit tab to go inside of it. I can hit tab again and hitting escape doesn't really do anything. I also can't hit tab again to go inside of this and interact with anything inside of here. So to me, the biggest difference between tooltips and toggle tips is twofold. First off, whether or not you have interactive elements inside of it, you're automatically going to be in toggle tip territory. You're going to have to be for the user experience and accessibility of this element. Another thing is the interaction of what you want to show and hide this content. So a tooltip here is going to be hover or focus, uh, something that's a little bit more light than a click, right? So if I click any of these, they're not going to do anything. Uh, the click is sort of dispatched separately from this uh, just presentation of this element. So anyway, we are building tooltips today, and that becomes very critical in the way that we're going to form our HTML and form our CSS. And it also means that we can do the majority of this with CSS. So let's head on over to the debugging corner, and we'll check out a couple things, you know, like features about these tooltips that I built, and we'll get into some of the technical details. Oh yeah, the debugging corner, I love it over here. So we've got light themes all across the top, dark themes along the bottom. So this tooltip definitely should be able to do light and dark themes. So here's our light and our dark theme here, excellent. Notice down here we have prefers reduced motion. So we just see a gentle crossfade. And up here, we're not preferring reduced motion. So we do see a slight amount of motion in the way that it's presenting. It's sort of directionality, like it's kind of coming from the element that owns this tooltip. Over here, we have right to left in the document mode. So see how our labels are over here. And if we go to top, look at even our like exclamation point is on the other side, go to block start, right and inline end. So these are logical property, um, contextually relevant tooltips. So they'll move with the document. And I thought that was kind of a nice touch to not just make them have a physical side, but give them a logical property as well. So we have hover working. We saw that tabbing through works as well. And notice when I tab, well, here, let's tab through. Let's let's undo reduce motion, right? See, now we see the slide a little bit now. And if I tab, notice that there isn't any motion. And I thought that was an interesting touch too, because if there was motion, the outline stroke and other things kind of tried to struggle to stay with that element while it animated. And by uh, only having a crossfade with the keyboard interaction, I'm able to have this much more soft feel, I think. Uh, so anyway, that was just a, a little design touch that I put in there. Another one is that notice if I mouse quickly over these, you know, well, relatively quickly, I don't see the tooltip unless I stay there for 200 milliseconds. And I thought that was also interesting that someone should be able to sort of like mouse over stuff like this and not see a whole bunch of tooltips. But if they do sit there for at least a little bit, we'll show them the tooltip. Right, So lots of little things adding up into this. I like this little uh, do don't example here because we have an input with some placeholder text and a label, which might feel like plenty to describe to someone um, how to interact with this input. But there's a temptation to always do this, which is remove the label and put everything inside of your tooltip. And that's not a good idea. You don't want to hide this. These tooltips are all about supplemental information that's not required. And it's not interactive. This is going to be something they're just going to casually find it's extra, uh, which also means that you should treat all these tooltips as progressively enhanced. If they don't work or something doesn't happen right with these tooltips, the user shouldn't be in a scenario where they don't know what to do. So anyway, we've got prefers reduced motion. We have right to left handling. We have touch. So here I can t uh, tap on these. Look at the error style version so you can customize them, which is kind of nice. Here's the try me one down here. 
And these are kind of cool uses for it. So I found that these tooltips are really nice for, I mean, you can put them on a link if you want, but really it doesn't matter. Uh, it can, can be nice for buttons if you want to add some supplemental information there. Like here's what's nice is a labeled button. It's really tempting to not label icon buttons, but you should always label them. And you can give them a tooltip to provide even more information about what's behind the destination of this icon button. This one I really liked here. This is the abridge element. In fact, it's kind of weird. Safari doesn't underline that here. Let me come down here to Chrome's. The abridge element has this underline style, which is nice because this is letting a user know that this is um, an abbreviation of the actual full on word. So here we have HTML in an ABR with a tooltip. And now I can say that it's hypertext markup language on hover. And we get this really nice tooltip that just enhances some supplemental information about this particular item. And then down here, this last example, you should already have alt text on your images, but this one allows you to put a tooltip inside of the picture and surface that nice alt text to your mouse and keyboard users as well. So sighted users can get that extra information about a picture if you like. And I thought that was kind of a cool use case, right? That's extra information about the picture uh, that you can provide supplementally. So if that's our overview, we've gone over you know, the sort of directionality of the document and how that works. We've got reduced motion. We have light and dark text themes. What else is inside of here to talk about? Well, let's dive into the screen reader experience next, and then we'll dive into some of the technical styles that got us there, like the use of has, the use of inert, which we'll see in just a second, uh, role equals tooltip, and more. On to the screen reader user experience. So I'm going to hit Command F5 to initialize VoiceOver on my Mac. VoiceOver. Now, it's worth noting that I did test this across Android Link. screen reader, Top. iOS screen reader, and some other screen readers to make sure that this solution was well-rounded because it was easy to settle with um, pacifying one screen reader and not all of them. But OK, let's go over this experience. First, I want to show you, or really, I want you to hear the experience before we dive into how I accomplished it. So close your eyes, and I'm going to hit tab, and we're going to move on to the next link inside of this document that we don't know much about. Link. Block start. Has tooltip. Use logical size. Two thumbs up with light skin tone. So we focused onto a link, and it said link, block start. That's normal. That's what a screen reader is always going to say when you focus onto a link. But then it took a breath and said, has tooltip. Use logical sides too. And then it described the emoji. Listen to another one. Link. Right. Has tooltip. Can I limit them? You Interesting, right? So if you can't see, we're almost getting a story told to us as the same as if we were seeing. So we see a link, we hover on it, and then it says, can animate them. To a screen reader user, they focus the link. It says the link text, right? And then it says, has a tooltip, can animate them. So to a screen reader user, they're not relying on the screen reader uh, technology itself to call this thing a tooltip. Even though we've given it a role tooltip, many screen reader users didn't have any affordances for that. So what I've done is I've added a, a pause so that it says link inline end has tooltip. The lot you know it said inline end has tooltip. There's breaths between there. Without any of this work, it would have just said inline end. The logical sides are more closely tied to the implementation. Because to it, it's just a chunk of text. But by splitting it up, I'm able to distinguish to a screen reader user what's the text to the link and what's the tooltip text. Or even just like link, here, we'll go link, down to the link, button. Try me, has tooltip, hi, button. It's a button. The text is try me, and it has a tooltip that says hi. I, I think that's really interesting. So let's break down a little bit what's happening here. And it's also worth noting that not every user is going to navigate with the tab key. They might use the screen reader. Uh, Motions, which is going to be customize like me this, has tooltip hi, but which allows them to go into elements mark. that aren't necessarily uh, focusable like this. See, this is just text, so it's kind of it's important to note that tab isn't the only way. That's just a keyboard user navigating your site. A screen reader user will navigate with um, alternative ways to go. They can jump between text and headings. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this, but it's important to test both keyboard and screen reader. All right, I'm going to turn off the screen reader, and then we're going to go kind of inspect how some of this is accomplished, and we're going to use DevTools. Voice over off. So I'm going to hit Command Option I to bring open DevTools. Let me pull this open a little bit larger here, and I'm going to hit the Accessibility Tree tool, and that's going to give us a view of these elements from the accessibility context. So here is our link. Our link has text top with a semicolon, has tooltip, hey, a tooltip, and that's exactly what we were read. And if we look down here, all we see is static text, and that's it. And the way that that worked is a couple of fun things that we did with our HTML. So I'm going to get rid of the accessibility view here. 
I'm going to look at our actual tooltip element. So here's our tooltip custom element. Notice it's not a web component. This is just a custom element. Any element with a dash in it could be a custom element, and the browser is just going to treat it like a div. I thought it was fun in this case to give a tool dash tip, the role equals tool tip. And well, we'll talk about inert here in a second, but that's just a hook for me to do my styling. You could have used a class name. It doesn't matter. I thought it was nice to see it as a tooltip. It reads well as an author in my markup to see that these are clearly tooltips. And then we'll make sure screen reader users, of course, get that same experience. So we also add inert onto here and roll tooltip. So roll tooltip, if a screen reader can, it will treat this particular element as a tooltip and it will show it in the dev tools as a tooltip. But since we've also given an inert We've essentially said uh, this element has no interactivity, kind of ignore um, any mouse events, touch events, focus events. So don't let this thing be focusable at all, right? Which is essentially how a tooltip works. We never should be able to go into it. That's the role of a toggle tip. A toggle tip would be one that we can focus into. So we wouldn't put inert on a toggle tip, but we are on a tooltip. So all of that to say, we're making this inaccessible from a sort of interactivity point of view, but we do want the content of it to surface. So if we open up the tooltip here, and in fact, let's just show hover. So let's simulate being hovered on this tooltip so we can kind of investigate the elements that are um, being put in here. We have the actual tooltip text. So this is what gets read aloud or it gets shown in, in hover. Also gets read aloud after this before text. So this before text is kind of a clever little user experience enhancement that I added. At least I think it is. We'll see how well it tests across other screen reader users as you all try it out. But it has this content, semicolon has tooltips. So that's how I, I'm giving the screen reader user some special text to give it a pause and then to say has tooltip and to read the tooltip text. The rest of these styles are all making it invisible to sighted users. So this is screen reader only text. Notice we don't see it in the tooltip here. It doesn't show up anywhere. And that's because it's being very effectively hidden from sighted users. But the content is still there. The text is still there. And the screen reader user knows that. I thought that was kind of neat. Another thing that's really interesting here is if we look at the after element, the after element is actually what's doing the whole bubble shape and this little arrow tooltip down, but the shadows are on the tooltip itself. And that's just um, a special little thing in here so that we could get a special shape and we get the special shape shadow, which is, uh, it was important to me that the little tick that popped down was actually part of the element and not a triangle pseudo element. I've had so many issues with little triangle pseudo elements that you could see a little line right here it was just so annoying. And maybe that line, since it was a pseudo element, wasn't changing the shadow. I don't know. It was all very obnoxious to me. And so this uses a mask. And so here's our mask down here being set to tip. And in each particular tip direction selector, like this is for top and block start, we're giving it the bottom tip. So if we were to go look at one of the other tips, we would see a top tip or left tip or right tip. And these particular tips are gradients written in a conic gradient syntax that essentially creates a little slice of pizza. And we position that piece of pizza, non-repeating, in the very center bottom in this case. And that's why we get that little thing. And so that's changing the shape of the border. So if we look here, see there's a border size. That's the orange. The border is being cropped by the mask, and that's giving us our effect. So these are actually shaped like the shape. Uh, there's no tricks and no seams. And I, I think that's a really nice solution here. So back to screen reader support, we've got the screen reader only text here. We have inert. And if we look at the accessibility tree, it's well represented that way. Although, look, it looks like it's a little upset at uh, our current scenario. But look, oh, they're just all ignored. OK, so it's, I guess it's just being honest about its representation right now. It's saying that that tooltip element is being ignored as all, all of its descendants. So any text and interactive elements, which you shouldn't have inside of there, are also inert. And so that's kind of interesting. We've got screen readers tabbing into this, getting presented with an element that is inert, but its content is being attached to the parent element and being read aloud to it. So I thought this was really cool. I thought the experience was really meaningful as the tooltip was announced to a screen reader user as a tooltip and wasn't just some surprise text that showed up. And yeah, that's how I was able to get that user experience in there. All of these things to say, I'm using inert. And I'm using has to, well, here, let's go look at how has is being used. Right, so I'm here on the anchor element. We can scroll down into our layer demo here, which says has tooltip. So we're using the has selector to find all the elements that have direct ascendant tooltips and giving them position relative. And that's allowing the tooltip element itself to position absolute. 
right? Position absolute and find its way in its particular C. This one's top position to find where it needs to be positioned at. So it's using a combination of insets and with uh, transforms to get itself into that particular position. And that essentially gives you all of the technical details, but let's dive into a little bit of the styles before we go. Here we are in my trusty editor. And just to preview really quick, this is what it looks like to author one. So we have that anchor element. Here's the anchor text and our tooltip inside of there with inert and roll equals tooltip and our text inside. And that's all it takes. Uh, notice this one doesn't even have a tip position. So this one is using the attribute tip position to change the tip position. We can look down here, tip position right, tip position inline end, bottom, et cetera. So that's how you change what side uh, the tooltip should be on. And then our styles looks like this. We've got a couple of custom properties to stash our padding, our triangle size, our background, our shadow strength, because we manage the shadow strength between light and dark. We need to have some good shadows there. Is right to left is a custom property to help us manage our transforms. Transforms are... Um, they don't have a logical value or a logical option. So we have to sort of create that with calc. And so if something is right to left or not, we can use that negative one or one in a calculation against an X position and sort of change the way that that works. Here's each of our masks. So our conic gradients for our bottom tip, our top tip, our right tips and stuff, our opacity and our transforms and our transitions on those our positioning, some font styles. So this is saying you can be as wide as your max content, but never go longer than 25 characters. So that's why short tips look short and longer tips start to wrap and multi-line. We've got our padding set here, our border radius. So these are all on the parent element. This also has a background of BG. Our color called canvas text is a system color that, that will be dynamically the color of the document. So in a light theme, it's black text. In a dark theme, it's white text. And we're saying we'll change on filter. That's to make sure that our, our nice shadows don't get messed up during transitioning. Here's our light theme. So we just flip the background to white. We make our shadows much less strong. Here we're using the dir pseudo selector to know if the document is in right to left. If it is, we flip our custom property so that we can, uh, that's going to be what, you know, flips things right or left in our um, styles here. I'm using the uh, at nest per the, the draft spec that we have here to create a new selector that says has tooltip. So this you can think of as our tooltip selector context that we were in before. It says has a tooltip. Give that element that does have a tooltip position relative. So that was a really fun way for us to create stacking contexts only for elements with tooltips. And then we can also extend that and say, and is hover focus visible or active, find the child tooltip and give it opacity one and transition delay. So we're looking at parent interactivity and then selecting a child inside of there, which is kind of cool. So if a parent has a tooltip and is being hovered focused and active, then find that tooltip and just some cool nesting selectors that that worked out really well. Here's our screen reader only text. Excellent. Here's our tooltip shape. So it can cast a shadow. We talked about that earlier. Here's the mask being set to tip. And then all the different positions are going to change the tip there. And it's just some text alignment. And then here's like an example of how top is being positioned. Well, actually, top isn't as interesting as right. Let's look at how right is being positioned. So we have an inset inline start. So that's like our left position. This is using an absolute position. We're calculating its own size plus the padding that's on the inline and the triangle size. So that's how we're getting perfect centering. Our inline block end is at 50%. And our Y position that's going to be using our transform is also 50%. If the user is OK with motion, we're going to go look to see if they're hovering or active. And we're going to find that tooltip and give it an out position. So this is going to make it so that this is negative three pixels. And when you hover, it's going to move to the right three pixels. This is our after. This sets our, our tooltip. So it says left tip. We're setting the inline in, or inset inline start. So this is um, another position absolute. This is our border inline start. Notice these triangle sizes match. So we're offsetting it based on the size of the triangle. And then we're creating the triangle and the border. And last, we flip to a different tip if we're in a different direction mode. And that's essentially how the rest of them are all positioned. So they all find their way between a combination of inset and transform translate positions, as well as a custom mask tooltip that shows which side that tooltip should be on. And that is it for the styles. The last thing here is, um, if you don't have has, so if the browser like Firefox, for example, doesn't have has, and this demo still works because I wrote a little tiny polyfill. The tiny polyfill says, hey, if this browser does not support the selector has, go find all the tooltips, find their parent elements, and give them a class called has tooltip. Then we'll inject a style tag that says has tooltip class position relative, has tooltip is hover focus visible active, and we'll give them opacity one transition delay of 200 milliseconds. And then we'll pin those styles to the document. And essentially we have polyfilled the feature so that browsers without has still get interactive tooltips. 
Whew, that is all to say that while I've built a mostly CSS only tooltip, I mean, we have this little polyfulfur has here, I do look forward to the anchor positioning API and the pop-up APIs that are coming out soon from OpenUI and they're being prototyped right now inside of Chromium as these are going to give you much easier ability to do toggle tips where the toggle tip can be, a, it's almost like a little mini dialogue. It'll come with light dismiss. It'll come with um, some inert management for you as well as it will be positioned in the top layer. So one of the things that's a bummer about these tooltips is they're children of an element, which means they aren't in the global positioning space. They don't have awareness of the window and they don't have awareness of other tooltips. And so they might show up underneath other elements, which is kind of a bummer. So I look forward to this future where we could build toggle tips as easy as we build a tooltip and then maybe we'll get the best of the both worlds at that point. We'll still need to do some accessibility testing. I look forward to those changes that are coming. Thanks for watching this GUI challenge on tooltips, and I'll see you around. Take it easy, y'all.